Brian, thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. Man, great to see you. Thanks for taking the time to do this. I, When I first started leading worship, one of the very first songs I ever learned, and I remember it so clearly, it was Come Now is the Time to Worship. And uh, I'm just doing the E shape, you know, up high on the guitar. And that was like my, one of my first songs I ever learned how to lead worship to. But I remember my parents all the time le- listening to Vineyard CDs. I don't know if it was like Vineyard Cafe or like Touching the Father's Heart series maybe. And there was songs on there by you. And I just remember your name all the time floating around amongst my parents. They were both worship leaders in our church. Uh, they were really involved at the Vineyard in Anaheim, you know, back in the early early days. And um, so I'm thrilled to talk with you today. My favorite, ultimate favorite song that you've written is uh, Faithful One. And I play that song a lot. Actually, when I sing, I sing songs to my daughter at night when she goes to sleep. And often, at least once a week, I'm singing Faithful One. Just an incredible Mm -hmm. song. So could you just maybe just share with everybody who's watching this. These are worship leaders who are watching it. Share a little bit about yourself and how you started leading worship and writing songs. Well, I love that, that um, there's a connection there between you singing Faithful One over your daughter because it was a connection with my daughter, my newborn daughter, that um, I wrote Faithful One. And uh, it was like, Okay, so this is like a couple of years into me starting to lead worship and such. And uh, I was overwhelmed with this incredible responsibility and gift of being a, a father, a new father with our first child. And I was feeling overwhelmed one day. And Faithful One was my prayer. Like, God, I need help so that I can be faithful, so that I can be a good dad. And so I just started pick up my guitar, almost like my baby daughter's in a, like a bassinet right in front of me. And I start mm-hmm. singing, faithful, so unchanging. Of course, I have no idea that other people will be singing this song. It's just my, yeah, you know, secret, private song to my maker. Yeah. And um I, I had actually one other song that I had written kind of in that same season called Father, I Want You to Hold Me. And um, and then I was asked to be the bass player at a Wimber conference, a vineyard conference. And uh, there was a session on the father heart of God, the father wound in culture. And uh, Andy Park, writer of the secret and many other songs that people will know was the leader and at the end of the father theme session he looked at me and said i want you to go up because he had heard in a small group once this song father i want you to i want you to go sing that father song over over the over the attendees you know there was like five thousand people there (laughs) and i'm a shy introvert and i'm the bass player right and yeah. I have to walk up there, hand shaking, grab Andy's guitar and sing, you know, Father, I want you to hold me. And after the session, Wimber approaches me, makes a beeline for me and says, my father was an alcoholic. Um, that song said what my heart wanted, needed to say to God, could we publish that song? And I'm like, what's publish? You know, I had no clue. And yeah. then he says, do you have any other songs? And I say, I have one other one. It's called Faithful One. And wow. he says, we'll publish that one too. So that's kind of how it started for me, it, kind of a midstream. But that's kind of how the songwriting and my connection with doing this and what we're doing here today started. Interesting. So the so- the early songs were published with Vineyard. That was the first songs you had published? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And John Wimber was the one that kind of heard those songs and and pulled them into the vineyard family. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. How did you get introduced to John Wimber to begin with? Well, um, let's see, how can I make this short? Um, We had heard that there was the very first vineyard church being planted in Canada. So that was in Langley, British Columbia, about 30 minutes west of, of where we live. And, and I'm still here, 
in the same house that I was I grew up in. I was four years old when we moved into this house that mm -hmm. I'm talking to you from today. So wow. uh, this is a place of roots for us. But we heard that the first vineyard is planted. And my mom had heard about this John Wimber guy and just liked what she had heard. So she packed us up <laughs> yep. and said, let's go visit this vineyard church. And I walked in the back, didn't know a soul. And I felt instantly at home because yeah. of the gentleness, the intimacy of the songs, the honesty of the songs. And yeah, uh, yeah. and so that's, so I, 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 I started getting involved in that church and then eventually I joined the worship team. I was a bass yeah. player, it was my first instrument. And then that led to that me connecting with Wimber at that conference. There's still nothing quite like those early vineyard songs like the no, early is. like you know in the secret spirit song yeah arms of love i mean yeah. there was a really a sweet spirit to those songs what's the one that, it's your blood was that a vineyard song it's your yeah. blood that cleanses me yeah i mean oh why does snow yeah. i do think though that one of the most beautiful like the in worship king in the worship song world the most beautiful two-line melody ever is from faithful one your love is the anchor my hope mm -hmm. is in you that is just it gets me every single time mm -hmm. and um i just am really thankful for these songs that you've written and so you have seen worship change a lot over the years yeah. and my question for you is why is it so important to choose the songs we're singing in church with thoughtfulness and care because a lot of the people you're going to be you're talking to right now are you know worship leaders who maybe just started doing this maybe they've been doing it for a couple of years and um you know they're throwing a lot of brand new songs all the time there's more worship songs now every week than ever i feel like and um a lot of times worship leaders can feel like hey we got to just bring in the the new song that's happening and build a set list and play through the songs and i don't know i think it can be hard to know what songs to play and so fr from your perspective i'd be curious why is it important to choose the songs we're singing at church with really thoughtfulness instead of just picking what's new hmm. Wow. Well, I mean, that's a big question. It's and there are a lot question. of things we could talk about. Maybe the thing I'll say for now is that our song selection, that which we repeatedly sing, is either formative or deformative. Like, either because the songs that we sing on repeat with a community of people and when we sing songs with a community of people they're they're deeper imprinted into us um the words of those songs matter because they guide us and aim us shall we say toward what really matters in life what what our priority should be what our values should be what our character should be so you know, like you talk about singing, your love is the anchor. Um, singing songs like that, that anchor us, um, make us people of trust, um, and make us people that are focused on love, not mm -hmm. just the love of God, but the love of community and the, what what real love is, right? Yeah. And if we sing songs repeatedly that are just primed for um, greatness, um, then they prime us in a, in a certain way that makes us want um, power. Um, and, you know, power has never accomplished what 
the true heart and work of God is, and that is the interchange of, I mean, I, okay, I guess it depends on what you mean by power, <laughs> right? Because obviously there is, there is good use of power, but you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. blunt force, awe and awe, you know, yeah. kind of power, spectacle kind of power. Um, so I think, I think, just taking time to say uh, to explore song lyrics and what we're emphasizing as as one of the things I say, you know, it's easy to put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, and all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. it goes kind of like it's the same word, but if you keep accentuating um, power, greatness. Um, those kinds of things, then you 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 tune yourself in a certain mm -hmm. way, and I think we're called to be tuned to love, tuned to gentleness, tuned to walking alongside the broken and offering hope and healing. How would you say that songs form or deform us? Um, the I think the formative part is actually connected to how the brain works. So our brain um, and the way memory works in us, um, music, wh when you take a, a set of words and you fuse them with a melody, it goes mm -hmm. into a completely different part of our brain than when you speak something or you read something. Okay. And once that, that, is in our memory, then that's what we call upon when we're in need, when we're in trouble. Um, and it, it forms neural pathways in our brain that, that get used over and over again, right? And that creates um, a, a, a tendency in our heart and our mind towards certain actions to certain attitudes yeah and and so the goal the goal i think of worship is to put ourselves in god's presence and in an, an attitude so that we become more like christ so that we take on the mindset of christ um so singing songs about jesus who he is what he did how he did it <laughs> is so incredible that's formative yeah. whereas um repeatedly you know like singing songs or putting songs into our memory banks that are about um character kind of things they're just about power they're just about inter mindless entertainment all of that kind of stuff that can in that sense can deform us by taking that love shaped heart and kind of harden it hardens it it kind of yeah. primes it for another kind of um action and um yeah i i i think songs i mean songs are this incredible vehicle you know three four five minute package but yeah. within it is life lessons it it's foundations it's um mindset it's heart you know mm -hmm. uh, oh this is what matters you know and then we we live out you know what we sing you know um which is probably yeah. one of the reasons why I've done the kind of music I've done over my life is because I don't want to be an actor when I'm singing. Mm -hmm. I just want to be Brian. I want to be me. I want to be honest. I want to be truthful. And I want the songs that I sing to match the life that I'm living. That's really good. I, I totally agree with you on that. In that, you know, there's times when there are times when I'm singing songs that I don't really mean or feel maybe what I'm singing, yeah. but I'm making the choice to sing them because I know that that's what I believe and that's what I want 
And it is almost like what you were saying about the neural pathways. I think I read somewhere too about like that you can actually change by changing the way that you think over and over and over. You can actually like change neural pathways with where your brain yep. goes in certain situations and moments and decisions you're making. Or if you have a lot of negative thoughts, you can actually retrain your brain to not go down that path every time. Yeah. And that's yeah. almost how sometimes I view some worship songs where I'm like, you know what? I don't feel or believe or like really want to sing this right now, but I know it's what's best for me and what I want my life to be. And so I sing it over and over and over to retrain my neural pathways <laughs> in a way. Yeah. That it is yeah. forming me. And I love that we're kind of talking about the importance of the lyrics in worship. I was talking to someone last week, I think, and they were talking about how especially in worship music, lyrics are so important because for Christians, the word of God is essential. The word of God, mm. those words are essential yeah. to the Christian life. And so what we're singing in church is essential to what we're putting in our brains, what we're putting in our hearts, what we're training our, our minds to think. And I, I do think that there's a major importance on the lyrics. And sometimes that can get overlooked by just, hey, let's play the new song that just sounds really cool and is really fun and people can dance to or whatever. But what is it? What is it we're actually singing? What is it we're saying? Yeah. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. It's all about the lyrical content. And it's, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I grew up that way. I was just, I zeroed in that. I, I mean, I love music. Um, I love great melodies. I love a great chord progression. But for me, it's always been about the lyrics and how the lyrics are making that connection between what's going on inside us and also what's going on in our life and how we're reaching, we're yearning for to become more Christ-like. Yeah. And, uh, I'm just curious to hear from you. What is it that you, what are you listening to these days? Because I'm guessing you're not like only listening to old Vineyard classics, although I listen to those all the time. I have a playlist on my phone. I'm listening to Vineyard classics all the time. But what what is some new stuff that you're hearing in the worship space that really grabs your attention and that you're really liking right now? Wow. I mean... I listen to, um, I don't, honestly, I don't listen to a lot of worship music per se, because that's the world in which I work and write. And I, so I listen to a lot of instrumental music. I listen to folk singer songwriters like Luke Sital Singh and Josh Hislop and people like that. I, I do um, really respect and like what the Porter's Gate is doing. Yeah. I'm familiar with them, and they've yeah. done these kind of themed work songs, yeah. lament songs, Advent songs, and now I'm really excited because their their new project coming up is all about climate and creation care. And mm. so it's like I feel like they're singing into gaps that modern worship is missing, you know. Interesting. I mean, I'm kind of a gaps guy. I, I write for gaps and um, I, yeah, I love that kind of music. You know, that's... I think you, you might want to, have you ever heard of common hymnal? Yes. And I've uh, sorry. Yeah, I absolutely could. Yeah. They're great. Listen to them. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking as you were saying that I'm like, you know, there are other people that are writing for the gaps. Yeah, and, and I, I use, as a worship leader, I use The Kingdom is Your, yeah. um, just as a, as a real song of invitation and hope, Yeah, you know, to sing, sing over people. So, so yeah. I didn't give you this question ahead of time. This is a little bit of a curveball, but I would just dying to know, because you have so much experience in leading worship. You've been doing this for a long time. Let's start with... I would like to know from your perspective for worship leaders, because really the job, almost like the occupation of worship leader has become a big thing <laughs> where like 20 years ago, there weren't, it was an occupation worship leader. It was like, Hey, can you lead worship? You're a volunteer. And now people are like, it's yeah. their job to lead worship every week. Are there, let's talk about like the positives and negatives that you've seen of where worship has, how worship has changed. And you could go anywhere you want, whether it's like worship songwriting or worship leading or the worship industry. Like, 
are there positives you've seen that have really like that you've been like, wow, this is, we've really come a long way in this over the past 20 years. And then maybe are there any like things that are concerning to you where we're like, you know, we may be missing it here in this area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I could say is that one of the positive things I could say is that people have begun to realize the importance of worship music and are willing to invest into it in people, mm -hmm. in gear, in focus, because they recognize kind of like that formative, deformative comment before that worship music is formative. And if it's formative, it's worth prioritizing, right? Mm -hmm. It matters. Um, and let's do it. Let's do it with excellence. Uh, let's not just, you know, throw together, you know, <laughs> something yeah. and, and be ultra, you know, yeah, right. cash about it. So I think, I think that's all positive. Yeah. I think what's happened maybe more concerning from my side is along comes the industry part and goes, okay, so this is happening. Now, how can we market this and what are we marketing and then i see this trend what i call the industry is marketing encounter with god mm -hmm. through intensity when i think we experience encounter god best through intimacy and intimacy and intensity are almost like sometimes polar opposites in mm -hmm. their practice in um in methodology and and even in values because it's kind of like i said before like if your focus is on the power on the greatness on the hype on the shock and awe like then you 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 put more and more energy into things like volume of the sound system and lighting effects and again the big of excellence in communicating music is not bad but if we think that the more intense we get the more likely we're going to have an encounter with god that is incredibly flawed hmm. right because yeah. you look at the biblical story you look at this history of humans having divine encounters and it's never through spectacle or whipping ourselves into a frenzy. I mean, that's what the prophets of Baal did. Um, it's actually often in the whisper. It's often in out in nature. It's often, you know, so yeah. when I do music, uh, in the gathered community context, I'm actually trying to evoke the whispers and the time out in nature. And the, I'm not trying to give myself over to a rock concert mentality. Yeah. That's yeah. really good. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Do you still uh, do you still connect and talk with any of the old worship guys from Vineyard, like Andy Park and Chum Cha yep. and Paul Balash yep. and yeah, that's yep. uh, who was the other? Oh, Dave. Um, who was the whole wide? Dave. David Roos. David Roos. That was it. Yep. Yeah. Wow. So that's so that's so awesome. Are you so? Are you still leading worship at a church? Are you in Vineyard yep. or are you at a different yep. church? Or yeah, we have a. We have a small faith community called The Table, and we're affiliated with the Vineyard. And we eat together. We always have communion together. And then we, you know, we we work together, you know. But it, yeah, very much so. Um, still That's involved. Awesome. And you're writing new music. Can you tell us about some new music you've been uh, working on or new music you've released? Well, we're... I've released it to my newsletter group um, already. It's a it's a brand new song called Mind of Christ, which is based on the Christ hymn of Philippians 2. And I'm very 
excited about that song because it it's like um a re-singing of one of the most important songs of the early church kind yeah. of the same scripture that partially inspired come now is the time to worship but this is a, a co-write with a dear friend an english doctor named steve mitchinson and um I love how it turned out. It, it it comes out to broad streaming services on Monday, Thursday, on the day before Good Friday. And um, yeah, and is so this, there's is it self-release? And, um, yeah. I'm, is it self-release? Really, yeah. Are you, who produces your music? Like who's actually, who does the recording? Is that something you do on your own or? Who are you uh, using no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have an amazing producer named Philip Jantz, and um, he's only half an hour from where I live here, Western Canada. Awesome. And um, he produced the You Shine album, the Today album, the Holy God album, my Christmas album, The Heart of Christmas in 2019, the Hymns album I did last year. So, yeah, he's been my, my primary producer. That's awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing that song. Is there, um, if you were having coffee, my last question for you is, if you were having coffee with a young worship leader, 15-year-old, hmm. who's just getting started, what are some, what's the wisdom or tips you'd want to hmm. give him as they're getting started? Hmm. I, I mean, in some ways, I would say, you know, if you can do anything else, uh, do it. <laughs> this isn't an easy road. Um, and then I would say, if if this really feels like this is deeply your calling, then your first job is actually um, to to learn and discover your own mother tongue, like who you are deep in your in your own soul. What does what does your expression of worship sound like and yes we learn other people's songs and we put their words in our mouth and we they start shaping us they give us um, um, an appetite for certain things but eventually to sustain this over the long haul imitation is not sustainable you have to discover your unique yeah you know, way you're yeah. going to do right. it, the way you're going to express it. And um, yeah, how God wired you not to just exactly. sound like the other worship guys out there, but how, yeah, what's your exactly. unique voice that God gave you? Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. And I, you know, I just say, you know, I always say lead worship with a whisper um, and never forget the poor and the suffering. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, those are kind of principles thread throughout the Bible, but you're not going to get an audience by shouting. Um, you're going to get it. You're going to get an audience by being genuinely you and, and actually just letting others do the amplification, <laughs> so to speak. Wow. That's gold right there. That's really good stuff. Brian, I appreciate you taking the time to do have this conversation I was really excited for this one, just as a vineyard, born and raised uh, worship leader. I know my parents are also going to be really happy about this one. Hi, mom and dad. Um, <laughs> so, no, this is just really cool. I really appreciate it. Thank you for what you've done. Gosh, the, I feel like hundreds of songs you've written that have impacted so many churches and worship leaders. Thank you for that. And thanks for sharing your wisdom today. I was You're pumped welcome. to be able to talk to you. So thanks for taking the time. You're welcome. Yep. See you around.